Hi fellas, welcome to the uh, 2017 season, South Adelaide Panthers. I thought it was a good idea to get this uh, online for you guys, considering we've had so much trouble getting together before the season starts next week. Also, it's going to be a useful tool for those who uh, have never planned a pre-season presentation or pre-season before, just to access it and get a little bit of knowledge how behind the scenes this works. Okay, so welcome to the 2017 season. Firstly, we're going to go through our goals for 2017. Uh, just quickly go over the coaching structure, the pre-season training schedule, okay, and the ins and outs and how I've produced that and why I've produced that and, and the way it's designed. The full 2017 training plan, okay, which will be provided to you all. Um, pre-season content, the playing philosophy, which I know a lot of you are keen to uh, know a bit more about. Um, positional requirements, what you should be looking for for each individual player to fit into our playing philosophy. Uh, coaches' commitments, what we expect from, or I expect from you as coaches, and the club expects from you as coaches for the forthcoming season. The coaches' pack, which I'll be providing to you online, okay? And then uh, any questions, and then we'll, we'll finish, finish off the presentation. Obviously, questions will have to be fired into me online for this. Okay, our club philosophy, which I've designed, is um, very much... Uh, Based something that we put on the, in the dressing rooms, okay, which is we play a we, obviously emphasizing the we. It's a very much a club of togetherness, um, building the teamwork into the players and the coaches. So we play a quick and effective style of football with adaptability, organization, and a high level of teamwork and endeavor. We play to our strengths, which in turn will become our opponent's weakness. We will never be outworked, outfought, or outthought by any opponent. And we acknowledge that we will achieve what we achieve is governed only by ourselves, our ability to work together, and our desire to work for each other. Some really important components in there, I believe, that if you know if you've got an effective group of players that are willing to impl implement all four of those, you're gonna go a long way towards being extremely successful as a team and as a club. If we can instill this philosophy into our juniors, so when they come to seniors. Okay, they've already got this ingrained into them. Um, and again, it, 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 um, the club will be extremely su successful because of that. And to finish off, a team above all, and obviously above all a team. Again, uh, emphasise of, of, on the teamwork, and, and this incorporates the coaching staff as well. The coaching staff are a team. Well, the coaching staff and the players are all one team. We don't want to position ourselves above the players where we're, we're separated from the players. You know, we're part of this, and we need to let the players un understand that. Okay, so our goals for the 2017 season. Okay, obviously this year the goal for the seniors is to gain promotion back to the National Premier League, having been relegated last year. So our targets are in all senior age categories, so that's the, um, the seniors all the way through to the under-16s, is finals football, so to finish in the top six. To instill the club's philosophy throughout the seniors, obviously we started that last season, but we're going to build on that again this year. So those players have already had one season in the National Premier League working on the club's philosophy. Now they're going to get the opportunity to do that in the State League. Okay, which should give them a little bit more of an opportunity to use the tools that we've uh, given them. To instill the club's playing philosophy. To encourage and develop our youth players to play senior football. This one thing that happened very, very well last year and we want to continue. You know, we want South Adelaide to be a, a club where it's seen that if, you, if, you, that if you're a youth player here that you, and you do the right things and you're good enough, you're going to get a shot at senior football. <clears throat> okay, 2017 coaching setup. Okay, obviously the seniors, myself, the coach, Danny Greystone. My two assistants will be both Ben Dale and Matthew Podonofsky. Okay, the reserves and under 18s. Reserves will be coached by Anthony Rideout, his assistant, Matthew Huntley. The under 18s will be coached by Andrew Shaw. Okay, under 17s coach, Mark Cousins. Okay, and the under 16s coach, Chris Gross. Okay. The, uh, the reserves and under 18 is a really important area for me, okay? I feel that this is probably the key area for development within the club. And from the reserves and then under 18s, we really want to be seeing players moving into the seniors. Good players from the under 18s may bypass the reserves and end up in the seniors. But last year, and what I want to continue in this year, we had a real focus on 
uh, um, coaches pushing their players forwards when they're ready and also developing the players so they can move up and ultimately your goal is to pr produce players for the seniors and when they get to the seniors players who have an understanding of the way we play. Uh, new this year we've got an under 17s okay which is obviously going to provide players into the 18s and the reserves okay and an under 16s which is going to provide players directly into the under 17s first. Um, the good thing about having an under 17s if we've got players that are eligible for the under 17s who perhaps don't get a full game in the reserves, the seniors or the 18s. Um, with the under 17s playing on a Sunday, these players can go down and play for the under 17s and get as much match time into them um, within reason. Okay, obviously we don't want them playing two games in a weekend, but we can get one game, one and a half games into them. That would be ideal for their development. Okay, so that's a setup for 2017. Okay, on to the pre-season schedule. The objective of the pre-season training program is to not waste a minute of training time and assure that everything we do within each session is focused on developing the club philosophy, the playing philosophy with all our senior teams. Okay, so obviously we don't have a great deal of of um, training time with our players being a semi-professional club. So we cannot afford to waste any of this training time doing things that are not relative to what we do on a Saturday, that are not conditioning our players and not preparing our players tactically for what we want to deliver on a Saturday on the pitch. Okay, and that goes for all three teams. Um, we'll train three times a week. Seniors will train four times after Christmas. So that'll be a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday. Training commences at 6.30. Now, this is important for me. This is something that didn't happen last year. Every senior coach from 16s through to seniors need to be set up for 6.15. Okay, so before most of the players come onto the pitch at 6.30 to train, we need to be set up and ready to go. Okay, last year there was a lot of standing around, coaches chatting to each other, and we're still putting cones out at 25 past, even 25 to 7 at some points. I found the longer the season went on, this started to get more and more slack. Let's be professional in what we do. Let's make sure we're set up for 6.15. Okay, Tuesday and Thursday will be at Cardine College, and the Saturday and Sunday will be at O'Sullivan's Beach. Um, that may be the Saturday at Cardine College as well. We're just in negotiations with that because we want to stay off our main pitch as much as we can. Okay, full training plan for 2017. This, is, this will be provided to you all. Okay, so I'm just going to open that. So this is what will be provided to you. Okay, is a full list. Let me just go back into that. So a full list of the training for the whole of 2017. Okay. So obviously, once we get past pre-season, the Thursday night becomes your tactical session, and you'll see here all the way up to, to round one, uh, or the last pre-season game, which you can start preparing yourself tactically for the last friendly. Okay, after that, it just simply says Thursday's tactical session, bit of SAQ and tactical session for the remainder of the year, because obviously that Thursday night is where you're going to be preparing your players for your Saturday game. Okay? Your conditioning has been prepared for you for the entire of the season. So we're gradually working on the Raymond Verheyen philosophy of um, conditioning your players so we don't have a high level of conditioning, extremely high level of conditioning just before the season starts and it starts to deteriorate throughout, throughout the year. This worked really well for us last year and I, and I think everyone would agree as the season progressed our players started to get fitter and fitter. Okay, I've slightly adjusted this because I think last year we probably, the increments went up a little bit too quickly, especially with the sprints. And we had a few players starting to come down with um, a few hamstring troubles. We didn't get any major troubles, but it was definitely there to see. So the increments have just gone up a little bit slower because we are dealing with semi-professional footballers who, uh, you know, work during the day as well. But all this has been prepared for you. So the whole season has been designed. Okay, so for particularly for the Tuesday night, I want you to adhere to this. Okay, keep to it for the entire season, um, and we'll obviously every six weeks we'll get together as coaches and we'll just sort of um, assess how this is going as we go along. Okay, but there you go; it's all there for you. Okay, this um, if you go across the page here, um, all the steps 
So when you're doing the big games, steps, how many reps you have to do, how many minutes, it's all provided for you. So there's no need for you to go and do any extra sort of study. Um, I've, it's, it's all there for you. All you have to do is follow the session plans that I've given out. Okay. Just get back in. Okay, so as we move on. Okay, so the preseason content. So obviously we designed this to achieve the objectives we set out for the 2017 season. Okay, so we want to be the best conditioned team and the best tactically prepared team in the competition. In all three, in all four senior uh, senior age groups. And within that, there'll be prior to the first round, there's 12 conditioning sessions, which when you look at that for semi-professional footballers is not a lot at all. 11 tactical sessions, the seniors will be doing 16 tactical sessions because we'll be coming in on a Sunday as well. Um, and the reason being a couple of them tactical sessions we may do as conditioning sessions just depending on how the week's gone. Um, but a lot of them tactical sessions are going to be on the following day from a game. Okay, so they have to be tactical sessions. Okay, they can't be conditioning sessions because you need to get the rest time in. There'll be six friendlies. Last year we had nine friendlies, but I just found last year with the amount of friendlies we had, we were just getting a little bit stale until before we got into some real um, proper competition and the season starts a lot earlier this year. So we, we, we've got six friendly fixtures um, and there'll be an internal trial on top of that. So all senior teams will be following the same training program and game plan. Okay. Um, I've also provided you with a conditioning run for missed training sessions. So anyone who misses a conditioning session on a Tuesday can be given the conditioning run to do on the Thursday, which should give them the max, should maximize their time on the Thursday and provide them with that key conditioning session during the week. Because players will start to learn that Tuesday nights a conditioning session, and that's especially on warm nights. They're the nights that you can you, you may get some excuses or working late, whatnot. It happens. It's semi-professional football. Okay, so we've got to make sure that those players get that conditioning session into them. And it's not punishment. It's it's you know they're going to keep up with the squad. They need to do to be doing the same same work and same conditioning sessions. Okay, so pre-season conditioning. The pre-season conditioning program has been designed to achieve the following. So achieve football-specific fitness. Okay. There'll be no long-distance runs in this. Okay. We're not trying to, do, trying to um, make our players fit for running a marathon. We're not trying to make our players fit for, for long-distance running and sustained bursts of very, very low, act, you know, low output training. Football is very, very specific. It's high burst, high energy, and intermittent training. So that's how this is how the preseason conditioning training has been designed for football, for nothing else. For those of you who were here last season and saw the way we approached the game, the first game, a preseason game against Comet Co uh, Cobras, where we were we won ten nil against the state league side, saw the difference between how explosive we were compared to the opposition. So to improve our strength and conditioning, we will all be doing the FIFA 11 warm-up, which has been provided for you, which is um, has been proven to decrease injury rates. Okay, can get a little monotonous as the season goes on, but that's where you just need to educate the players and make them understand the importance of doing this. Okay, there's three different levels of it, so you can every week you can be doing a different version of it just to just to get away from that monotony. And something that I'm very big on is the speed, agility, and quickness training as well. So we'll be doing the FIFA warm up one one uh, one session, and the SAQ training before your tactical session just to get the movement and um, the footwork correct. So it's obviously to improve our endurance, but football specific endurance controlled and football specific again all everything's airing towards being a, developed around about football as a game specific to our game Im improve recovery rates of course with short intermittent drills okay the game is short and intermittent intermittent okay with explosive actions okay so this is how i've designed it and obviously again the conditioning run for missed training sessions improve our speed improve teamwork and improve the tools to implement the playing style. 
and of course injury prevention. Okay, if the player's conditioned correctly for the game, and there's going to be less injuries, particularly at the start of the season, when they start playing competitively. Again, our philosophy will never be outworked, outfought, or outthought by any opponent. Okay, the tactical element of preseason. It's been designed to achieve the following: to implement a playing philosophy that suits our players. Okay. What we have to accept is in the south of Adelaide, we, I believe, and even Australia to some extent, we develop a certain type of player. For me, that's a very, very strong physical player, um, which has all the attributes, has the endeavour, has the work rate, has the heart, has the willingness to win, but really does lack in some areas the technical aspect of the game. Um, so, especially from a senior level, I have to instill a playing philosophy that suits our players. From reserves and down, we want to develop, be developing our players. So when they get to senior level, they've not only have they got the, the, the everything that's good about South Southern players, they've also got the, um, the technical aspects of the game as well. Okay, so I've based our playing philosophy around that. So to ensure easy progression from juniors through to seniors, we want everyone at the club, every junior at the club, to see a pathway through to senior football. And from this season forward, every junior will be working on the same pathway, the same playing philosophy, which is a little bit different to the Australian way of playing football, um, the Australian um, national curriculum. Okay, I've actually based this more so. I've taken the best bits out of the Australian curriculum and I added the best bits out of the German curriculum which I think suits the Australian game a little bit more um, just because of the type of players we produced. To be the most organised team within the competition, to assure that players understand their individual roles and responsibility which is key to having a tactically successful team. To ensure continuity again throughout the seniors, I, yeah, under, if our under 18s have got the same set plays as the seniors, I don't care about that. Okay, because if your set plays are done correctly, um, it doesn't matter whether you're, the opposition knows what you're doing or not, they're going to find it difficult to stop. And to be quite honest, at this level, there's not many senior coaches are gonna, what, who are going to correlate what the under 18 is doing and think that the seniors will be doing exactly the same thing. Okay, um, So there should be some sort of continuity there. So if I bring a player up from the 18s, he immediately knows what, his, what our set plays are all about. And obviously to win football matches. <clears throat> Again, our philosophy at the bottom there. Okay, so the club playing philosophy. We'll go through that again. We won't read through that again, but we'll just click through it. Again, just a bit of a recap. Team above all and above all the team. Okay, our formation. We've obviously gone for the 4 2 3 1. Okay, there's two different variations of this. There's a 4 2 3 1, and you can obviously reverse the triangle and play a 4 1 4 1. Okay, um, that basically depends on the players you've got. I would like to keep this formation in the reserves in the 18s, 16s, and 17s if we can. Okay, because we really want to be able to develop not only your defensive midfielder, but also your central midfielder who's going to become your pivot man and your playmaker. Okay, notice the wide players are tucked in, not so much wide, but they're, uh, they're more, um, they become sort of inside, inside wide players. And the one target player up front. Why, so why the 4 2 3 1? Okay, even spread of players throughout the pitch. Okay, because of the formation, there's a lot of passing lanes. Okay, there's triangles all over the pitch. It's ideal for the transition to an immediate press after possession turnover. This is why we play narrow. This is why our wide players are tucked in. Okay, so there's going to be some points where your wide right player finds himself on the touchline, but your wide left player is going to be tucked in, which can push the other midfielders over. So if for any reason he does lose the ball or we turn over possession, we have players very, very close to enable us to press the ball and win the ball back as quickly as we can. It's called gagging pressing. Okay, so as soon as we as soon as we turn the ball over, we're looking to at pace win it back within the first few seconds, which is quite frankly the easiest time to win the ball back. 
Okay, prevent provides many attack, attacking options. The reason being because not only have you got your inside wide players, um, it also leaves the wide areas open for the fullbacks to attack as well. Okay, players close together for good combination play. Obviously, you you've got to work on this during your training sessions with your rondos and your tight passing. Okay, but once you've got that going and your players are close together, you will it will it will work very very well. Uh, it confuses the opponent's defensive roles with your outside wide players playing a little bit more narrow. They almost play between the areas of fullbacks and centre halves. Okay, so that can confuse the roles. Do the fullbacks come in and mark, or do the centre halves come in? Okay, so you you should find that your wide players find themselves with with time and space on the ball against a lot of opponents until they, especially early on in the game, whilst they're still trying to figure out that out and sort it out. And it's effective for the counter attack. Okay. So our style of play defending, we've got three ways that we defend. Okay, so this is completely when the opposition have the ball are in good possession of the ball. Okay, we call them three different names. So the Vegas, the Idaho, and the Texas are there as as names that you can call out to your players within a game and completely change the style of which you're trying to win the ball back without the opposition coach or players having an understanding of what you're doing. So, for example, if all your players on the pitch are shouting Texas, they all know that if that's going into a defensive retreat, but the opposition doesn't know. So we've got three styles, high-press defending, Fullback ambush and defensive retreat, and we're going to go through all three. High press defending, which is the Vegas. So when to apply? Obviously under the coach's or captain's instruction. Uh, the captain may see, see, see an opportunity to press on the pitch that the, the coach doesn't see. When the opposition attempts to build up from the back. Now, because of the Australian national curriculum the way it is, we have a lot of teams in this country building up from the back and building up from the back, trying to build up from the back at every opportunity. I've even come across situations where coaches have instructed their players to not play it long under any circumstances. So these are the sort of teams that we want to test their build-up play and see if we can win that ball, win it early and win it in their defensive third. Okay. So obviously when the opposition defence is uncomfortable in possession, I've not come across many teams in Australia who are comfortable in possession at the back. It's just not been happening. We just don't, we're just not producing the players for this to be, for them to be comfortable at a high level and at a very quick pace. Okay, so even in the National Premier League, we've caught out a lot of teams playing this way. Okay, when the momentum of the game has swung in your favour, so when you can see you're on top of the game, momentum's a big thing in football, okay? Um, and the flow's with you, and they try and play out from the back or trying to play it short, or even if, they're, even if they're still kicking long from goal kicks, we can press high, okay, because the momentum's with us. And obviously when you're attacking players of sufficient energy to apply with high intensity, and now this is something as a coach you really do need to keep an eye on, because it's a very demanding high energy style of trying to win the ball back and they're going to be certain times of the game and during the season or for the full game when your players are not going to be able to do this which is when you need to shift to one of the other two styles of defending okay so how to apply okay we'll go through it in the diagram the right midfield and left midfield position themselves so they can apply immediate pressure to the centre back and also cover the ball to the full back. Press from out to in to force centre back towards the goalkeeper. So we're trying to force them to play back to the goalkeeper. Now, what's different to this and a lot of the presses that a lot of other teams do is a lot of teams leave the goalkeeper unopposed. We're not going to do that. So the centre forward is going to try and pressure the ball to the goalkeeper and look to intercept because we know that they're going to play, that's their out ball, okay? The opposite right midfield and left midfield will close in and block the passing lanes to opposite centre backs, okay? Which will become a little bit more apparent in the diagram. The attacking midfielder blocks a passing lane to the opposite centre midfielder. The centre midfielder is positioned in front of the opposite attacking midfielder and the whole team reacts to the press and squeezes up to restrict space. So important.
There's no point in your forwards and your midfielders applying high pressure if your defence is going to leave a big hole in between the defence and the opposition midfield. Or even the goalkeeper leaving too much space in behind the back four. Okay, so this is how it looks. So the ball playing out from the back. So we've got the opposition, which is in red, set up as most as the Australian curriculum and every other team that plays out from the back instructs you to. Okay. The LOC is a line of confrontation. So this is where you instruct your players to start confronting the opposition. Okay, so this will change the further back that we go. So anything behind that, so if your um, if your um, defender drops right into the touch line, allow them to have it and allow them to come up to this area. Okay, we don't really want to see players going that deep to press the ball because it just creates too much space in this area. So allow them the space to, so their starting point is just a little bit higher. So our starting point is just, just deep enough so he's comfortable in playing this ball, okay? The line of confrontation. Now your left midfield and your right midfield and their initial positions are so important. They have got to be in a position where they stop this ball here into the wide player. So close enough where they can press if he does attempt the long ball. Okay, and on the other side, close enough to that side. So the goalkeeper's looking and he sees both easy options here and he sees that this is a danger pass and this is a danger pass. But he's close enough that he can still press as the ball arrives. Okay. Okay, so the ball goes into the center back. Okay. Now, what the wide player has to do is press the center back at an angle. Now, notice the curve of how he presses the ball. Okay, that is to cut off the direct ball into the wide player. Okay, so we don't want him getting a touch playing straight out to the wide player. Okay, obviously, he's left this, this man here, so that's all going to be apparent. So he's going to have two options one to play in here or in there or back to the goalkeeper. Okay, if we've got his head down, he's only going to look for short options. So, curve the run. And obviously, this, the, 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 the easy ball back at the moment is the goalkeeper's ball. The ball back to the goalkeeper. So, this is the one we want our centre forward pressing and trying to cut, it, cut out. Um, we nearly, nearly got quite a few goals last year, especially in the early parts of the game, catching them out with this. Okay, you will start to score goals very, very early on. Obviously, this has left a lot of space in here to play into the midfield. Right midfielder, the opposition midfielder cuts off this long ball across to the other side. Now, this is a really important job because if we're going to press to one side of the pitch, this is where you're going to be left vulnerable on the opposite side of the pitch. The attacker midfielder covers the ball into their pivot. Okay, defensive midfielders come in and we press and we make sure there is no easy ball into their midfield. The left back, the wide full back moves up to cover their wide man. And obviously this leaves a bit of a danger ball in behind here. And when the ball's on this side of the pitch, this is where our center halves move over and our full back. So obviously we can see here the danger is the opposite side of the pitch. So no matter what happens, this player has to force this guy to play short. What he cannot allow to happen is him to get that close that he gets beaten and he's got his head up and able to play balls through, which which will uh, obviously cause, him some, cause us some uh, trouble. Okay. Goalkeeper obviously moves up as well. He shouldn't be forgotten here. Because maybe a quick ball back to the goalkeeper and we're, we're hitting the ball straight over our, our centre-half's head. So he's got to be in a position here where he's nice and high and able to sweep any long balls that come into these wide areas. Okay, so we're just going to look at that again as a block. So, line of confrontation. Ball goes in and this happens together as a unit. Okay, just watch again. And that's the movement you want from your players as that ball's traveling. Obviously, that takes a lot of coordination and thinking and pace. Okay? 
so we move on to the fullback Idaho. When to apply, obviously, again, under the coach's, the captain's instruction. When the opposition has gained success playing out from the back. So if we're playing out a team which is very, very good at building from the back, we probably want to give them a little bit more of their final third to play in. Okay? Because if they're getting out successfully, it leaves us very, very high and very vulnerable. So we just drop our line of confrontation back. Okay, when the opposition defense is consistently being bypassed by the goalkeeper. Okay, so if the opposition is playing, just at, the goalkeeper has a really good kick or the center half is just clearing your back four and putting balls, good balls behind, in between your back four and your goalkeeper, which are dangerous balls. We just want to drop our back four and a whole team shape back around about five to 10 meters. So it encourages them to play short. When the opposition doesn't attempt to play out from the back, let's encourage them to do it. Because ideally, if we can win the ball in their final third, that's their defensive third, that's where we want to win it. We don't really want to be consistently challenging 50-50 balls all game. When the attacking players and our team has not got sufficient energy to high press. So we're, as we're tiring, we can drop our line of confrontation back somewhat. So how to apply again, your right midfielders and your left midfielders position themselves so they cut off direct ball to the opposite wide midfielder and in a position to arrive on the fullback's first touch. Okay, this will you'll get a bit more of understanding this when we go to the diagram. The centre forward or attacking midfielder press an angle to force the centre back to play wide. Must cut off the ball to the opposite centre back. Again, that will become more apparent with the diagram. The defensive midfielder marks opposite midfielders man-to-man -man and position to intercept the passing lanes okay when the center back plays the fullback this is a cue to press with pace and intensity the only out ball for the defense should be the goalkeeper reset position or i.e. playing back to the goalkeeper or and that's when you reset or long a direct ball under pressure okay and may i add under pressure there okay we don't want a goalkeeper playing under no pressure um, we want him playing under duress if we can because it obviously makes his kicks a lot less accurate so here you go the fullback ambush alder notice the line of confrontation is a little bit further back okay so this is a position we want to we're, we're looking to win the ball so we've now given the opposition this first ball out to the center half so we dropped ourselves back so you notice how this is made us a little bit more compact not as high energy Okay, so there's your line of confrontation. First and foremost, cut off the long ball to the opposition's fullback. Notice now it's not the not, not opposition's wide midfielders, not the opposition's fullback. So again, we were in a position to to um, to either press that one or that one, but not in a position to press this one on both sides. So that's going to encourage the ball out to the center half. Okay. Again, your, your wide midfielders positioning and their, their uh, intelligence is very, very important here. Okay, so obviously balls goes, goes out to the centre half because this is where, this is an easy out for the goalkeeper. Everything else he plays is a 50-50. Okay, so that's his, that's his 100% ball. So that's what we want him to play. And obviously his centre half now is, is, is in control of the ball. So now we want to condense the pitch. To one side so you're in tack and midfielder again look at the angle of approach if he goes straight if he goes straight to the defender that gives him two options into his pivot man three options keeper pivot man in here or in here if he angles his approach he cuts off his playmaker so he's always looking over his shoulder see where his playmaker is angle his approach to force the center half to look to this easy ball. This right midfielder has still not pressed this guy. He's, he's off him six, seven, eight yards. Okay, so the first pass he sees, which is comfortable, okay, is straight into his fullback. To enable that to happen, the center forward has got to get himself a position where this pass across the pitch looks like a danger pass. So now, okay, you will get some center halves which back themselves, chip it over there, but it's a danger ball for him. If it happens once, just tell your centre forward just to go a little bit further. Just to get himself in a position where, if he does try it, he's in a position to press straight away. Okay? 
Again, your midfielder's role in here is important. See him get in front of the opposition to cut off the passing lanes. Again, we're showing him this one pass to the touchline. Defensive meal had come across, and notice your position of your uh, other opposite wide player a little bit deeper. Okay. So the ball goes in. Now this reaction to this pass, because we already know this is a ball he's going to play, this player should be arriving on his first touch. And this is where we're looking to win the ball. We've got our whole team pretty much shuffled over. So the defense shuffle over as well. You probably six, seven times out of ten, you'll probably receive the, the pass will come in into here. And we've got four versus three versus one over this side of the pitch. And we'll win the ball in this area. And notice when we do win it, and if we do win it, look how compact we are to break through and counter. And look at the ball straight into the center forward. So if we win this very, very quickly, straight in, attacking midfielder straight in. Okay, within one pass, we could be in for a one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper. And again, let's not neglect the goalkeeper. He's got to be switched on to everything that goes on. There's no point in this guy being sat over the line because this could happen. Straight in behind your back four. On touchback, straight in behind the back four. He's got to be aware that that's the danger ball in there. So let's look at that again. Ball goes in, as it's traveling, a midfield shuffle, force him into the wide area again. As this ball's traveling, we arrive on the first touch. Okay, let's have a look at that again. Let's go back to the ball from the keeper. Again, it's, it's just the mirror image on the opposite side. Angle of the press of the attacking midfield is so important and the role of your wide wide player into the wide area, and we win the ball. Okay. So the defensive retreat, when to apply, again, under the coach's catch, captain's instruction. When the opposition has gained momentum, which will happen, we see this in games, and they're consistently pressurizing, there are going to be times when you're going to have to drop in, compact, and do a defensive retreat. When the opposition is playing the long ball in behind the defensive line with success consistently, and when I say cons success, obviously they're getting behind. Then they may be a, a long ball side, and they've got players which um, which do very very well under them conditions. Okay, so we may want to drop ourselves back again to further encourage them to build out from the back. When defending the lead under consistent pressure, it could be the last five minutes of the game. The op or we may be down to ten men, which will come on in a second. Okay, so it's just about, we've seen mo a lot, so many professional teams do this. You just get back in, two banks of four, 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 two, okay, and slide and defend or, and can be compact in all areas of the pitch. When the opposition is vulnerable to the counter-attack due to lack of pace. So if the opposition has a really, really slow back four, but who are very, very good in the ball, are good at coming out from the back, you may want to draw them up, draw them up. So when we do win the ball, okay, this one ball in, we can counter-attack very, very quickly and they're not going to catch our centre forwards. Okay, or when you've gone down to 10 or 9 men due to injuries, sending offs, etc. This is, you know, again, we've seen it so many times in professional games. This, you drop back into this defensive retreat. And you, you can, obviously, it's, it's trying to protect your goal as much as you can. But also, it still leaves the opposition very, very vulnerable to a counter-attack because their defence their defense is so high up the field. How to apply a deep and compactive defensive positioning, allowing the opposition to approach the halfway line with the ball. Your formation drops to a 4-4-2 defensively. Your work as a unit, squeezing, dropping and sliding as a team. Good, effective communication between the lines, very, very important. Good one-on-one -on -one defending and patience. Patience being the key, it's a little bit different to the high press, you wanna be patient. You don't want players diving in 1v1 because it obviously it creates space in behind them. And your first priority to, to be, prevent balls forward, then pressure to win the ball. Okay, so what I mean by that is if you have players pressing all over the pitch for long periods of the game in a defensive retreat, okay, um, you, you can get tired very, very easily. So what we want to see is to sometimes just get yourself in a position where they stop the forward pass, which is when you see in the professional games a team just slide in and the opposition are passing side to side the side or the defensive and the midfielders players do that are preventing that forward pass okay and, and counter attack quickly and effectively and gain 
Mehmet gains some um, yardage on the opposition. Very, very important. Your, uh, your, your forward players are very, very selfless here. Can they get a set piece? Can they get a free kick? Can they get a corner? That's where you're likely to get your goals from with this. Okay, so nice and easy diagram here. Obviously, the line of conf confrontation has got a lot deeper now. Yeah, that line of confrontation may, depending on the size of it, be your halfway line. Okay, just depending on how, you know, how the, the, the stage of the game and how much momentum the opposition has got, that could drop to your halfway line or even inside. You're, as long as you're compact and you're doing it as a team, okay, again, that can be, that can be adjusted. And it's very, very simple. We drop into a 4-4-2. The reason we drop into a 4-4-2 is because one player, we don't want one player just sprinting across the, the, the pitch doing doggies. So if the centre forward is, is pressing over this side, so the ball comes in, the attacking midfielder does drop, drop into a deeper roll, but if they get the switch in, he goes across and he drops in and does that job. Okay, so these two are working. One, He's working the left-hand side of the pitch. He's working the right. Okay. And you allow them to come forward. Again, so you see there, the centre forward is pressed, but the attacking midfielder is dropped a little bit deeper. Okay? So our attacking style of play. Okay? In an ideal world, we want to build out from the back if we can. Okay? And this is certainly what we want to instill into our reserves, our 18s, and our younger players. Okay, but you have to have the players that are confident in doing so. And reserves... 18, 17, 16, if one of your centre-backs makes a mistake, it doesn't matter, okay? They're going to make mistakes. Just just remember, they're going to lose the ball and cost you goals. It is going to happen. But unless they make these mistakes, they're never going to be a senior football that can build up from the back, okay? The reason we build up from the back is obviously it's better to build up in control of possession than it is to constantly challenge for 50-50 balls, which is what most goal, which all goal kicks result in. Um, we want to build in wide positions. Um, we want to be in a position where we can switch play. So we're going to look at our fullback overlap. Combination play becomes very, very important. And our counter attacking. Okay, so building out from the back, when to apply. When the opposition is not pressing high or do not press effectively, so maybe the first time we try out to build up from the back, their press is not in unison, they're not doing it collectively as a team so we can come out under good, good pressure, or they're, if they're dropping off, okay, if the opposition is dropping off, you've got to understand they are going to have more players around your 50-50 than you are. Okay, it's a fact because you're going to have these four players at the back against their three, so they're always going to be an overload. So drop your centre halves back. Let's see if we can gain possession of the ball. And even if we're gaining 20, 30 yards from a long ball, it's better than your goalkeeper just playing into the mix. So obviously our defence and goalkeeper needs to be con uh, defence and goalkeeper needs to be confident in possession. When the midfield and attacking players can create space and are confident in possession, again, possession, 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 and confidence is key. The confidence is going to come from our younger players making mistakes and being shown how to do it effectively. To draw the opposition forward to create space in the midfield or behind the opposition defence. So, again, you might, you might actually try and build from the back to create space in the opposition's final third. So playing out from the back is going to bring their defence forward as it has done with, with, with the way that we play. So we know it's going to create a space in behind. If they have a slow back four, that might be why we play out from the back. So it might be a ball just dropped back to the goalkeeper or in behind their defence with pace. And to waste time if in a winning position. Okay, So we might want to build out from the back. If you build out from the back effectively, you are always going to have an overload. Your goalkeeper is always going to be an extra man. So it may be a position, if we're good at it, we can buy some time and buy some minutes when we're in a winning position. So how to do it? Good tactical spread of players to create space. The midfield show and create space, and they try and receive facing forward. Not easy, okay, but must be taught. The set midfielder drops in between defenders to receive is required. Your set midfielder, i.e. your pivot or your playmaker. Players must be confident in possession. All players must create passing options and be available. 
And the last resort is obviously is to play the target play and work off him. So we don't build out from the back if it's not working. Our final resort is obviously it's not happening. Let's not let's not get ourselves into a trouble. That's why we have a target center forward. Okay, if it has to go to him, it has to go to him. So building that for the back, we look at the tactical spread. So fullback's nice and high up the pitch. Center half split. Okay. Pivot comes in, so here's your playmaker. So you end up with three at the back, basically. So we're now playing a three, four, three. Okay. So this is why we don't get consumed with formations too much. Okay. So, and your wide players just come slightly in, and obviously their defensive line is going to be a little bit higher. So your centre forward gets himself in a position where he's on their defensive line. So I'm pre I'm presuming here they've actually squeezed quite high to presses. Okay, so building in wide positions. So there's a lot of time when we're building up from back, we're going to end up in them wide areas. So the opposition will, like we do in the fullback ambush, will try and force you to play wide into wide positions. If we cannot build up centrally, which if a team is pressing effectively, or we haven't got midfielders who are winning that, bat that possession battle in the center of the park, who do not want the ball, Okay, we have to play out wide. Um, obviously, playing wide, there's less um, danger to our goal if we do turn over possession. Okay, obviously, turning over possession centrally um, goes straight through to our goal. So, to target the opponent's fullback or weaker defensive players, so we in the first five minutes, we may have seen a fullback out of position, playing on the wrong side. Um, and in general, every team you play against, Generally, their fullbacks tend to be their weaker players. This is why we target them. They tend to be players that can't really play centre half, so we end up putting them at the fullback. Not in all teams, but in a lot of teams, especially at semi professional level. If a player is out playing out of position, he's generally a fullback. So after a quick switch of play, whilst the opposition is sliding, what I mean by sliding is when the whole team is moving across and condensing the pitch. Okay, obviously, if we can get the ball out into the opposite side of the pitch to play, there's going to be more space for us. What we're trying to prevent when we do the, uh, the fullback ambush and uh, high press. Okay, when our wide players are out functioning, the opposition wide defenders. So if we're getting some success out wide, let's continue to do it. So if, uh, you know, during that first five, 10 minutes, you want to encourage your wide players to see if they can get on top and go out their fullbacks very, very early. If you find they're on top of one of their fullbacks, let's keep going that way. Okay, let's let's if something's working, let's keep doing it. And when we have achieved success again from wide deliveries. So just a couple of examples here. You, you can be creative with this, but we want to give some examples to the players of combinations in wide areas. Okay, so usually when we build up from the back, it goes into the center halves. Um, we're looking for this this wide midfielder to come and ask the question of the opposition fullback, okay? Does he stay, does he go? So in this example, the opposition fullback's man-to-man -man marking. So he's gonna follow the opposition, uh, follow our wide play, which leaves a big area to exploit for either the fullback or the center forward, okay? So this is just a combination where the fullback, you, both, you, both your wide player and your fullback are in tune to what's going on. So the fullback knows if the ball goes into the wide midfielder, into his feet, okay, it's going to be a knockback or either back to the centre half or in the first time for him. Okay, you'd be surprised how often this works. So second example, again, you can be, you can be creative these, but your players need plans. Okay, you can't expect your players just to go out and be work off the cuff. This is what teamwork's all about. This is why we tactically train, not just for not just being planned at set pieces, but also being having a plan when we have the ball in certain areas of the pitch. Okay, so at this point, the the fullbacks decided to keep his shape. Okay, great. Shout a turn. Okay, and then we're looking to play the centre forward in first time because he's the one who's got. The, 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 your wide midfielder there has got time. He's got time on the ball. Okay, if he comes and gets pressed into here, 
Okay, that means your attacking midfielder is free or he's free into feet here. Okay, but when you do this in a training session, you'll see all these things start to happen and, and it will paint a better picture for you. Okay, so again, we're looking to exploit that line. So switching play, the fullback overlap. So when do we apply this? Okay, so when there are no, when, when the opposition def is defending very, very well, and the wide areas and we we don't see a good through ball or over or they've defended a little bit too deep if they are compact and shuffled across cross they leave the opposite op option for the opposite fullback to attack the space okay or when the opposition defensive line is quite deep so we can't get playing behind them or and they're compact enough so that we can't play into our midfield so we'll just have a look at the examples so how to apply the fullback positions himself in a wide and in a position to attack the open space. Good quality possession to enable a player to switch play. Quick and accurate passing to ensure that the switch. If your players already have this plan, you've got more you more likely for the passes to be quick and accurate because even before they're receiving the ball, they know what they're going to do with it. So the control is going to be that should be in the right area. And obviously, if they've gone over this time and time again in training, it becomes a lot more. Uh, uh, robotic for them okay um, so confident and driven pass so we've got to be good they've got to be good at this passing into the on rushing fullback to ensure that should be ensure not ensure that they gain an advantage and can move into the space so here you've got an example here where we're going down the side of the pitch okay into our fullback but look at if the opposition let's say they're playing a defensive retreat which they are in here the R position is nice and compact where they should be. The back fullback in line with the back post where he should be. This leaves an, a wide player tucked in, okay, occupying this back player. Okay, if your wide player is out here, he kills all this space. Okay, we want him tucked in close to your center forward looking for opportunities in here, which leaves all this space free. Okay, if this guy stands out here, this must mean we have an overload in here. And we must be, must have space to, to work it in here and play in. So we're just forward on. So here we're playing. It's not happening. It's too tight, but we're going to keep possession. We come back out to our centre half, and he looks to play that straight away into the, the fullback. And obviously when that happens, fullback runs onto the ball. Okay. And as that would happen, our centre half would get over. We would get over and we'd transition into attacking positions on that side. Okay. Another example in there to the wide midfielder, no space, but we still managed to keep it through our defensive midfielder. And again, he's looking for that switch because he knows that's where the space is going to be. Okay, you'll get this to a point where your defensive midfielder doesn't, doesn't even have to look whether he's in there. He knows he's going to be in there, so it's just a touch and it's a ball in. The amount of times last season I saw this ball on was unbelievable every single game okay but you need players who have worked on this and have the capability of playing it combination play when to apply positional play between the front four attacking players that occurs in all areas of the pitch so we want our front four players to combine when we have good possession of the ball and the opposition have a structural style of defending so if they've dropped in and they're defending that forward pass you know we need some movement between our front four players when the opposition midfielder drops a support, creating space for attacking players to work in, and after well-structured build-up play, when we have effective possession of the ball, how to apply the center the center midfielder players, our playmaker, combine and rotate to allow passing lanes through to the attacking players. Attacking players recognize the right time to drop and support, and the attacking players recognize the vacant areas and make well-timed and angled runs. Now this is important, you need to work on this with your players. Good attacking players do this instinctively. Okay, this is why we pay good money and big money for good attacking players. Okay, but we will have to work on our junior players on this, no doubt about it. So good quality and well-timed passes through to attacking players. If the player that's in possession has got an understanding of what your attacking players may be doing, there's more, there's, there's more likely that it's going to be a well-timed pass. Okay, so just a couple of examples here. This, this will be in all areas of the pitch. This is the example where the opposition are pressing high again. We'll go out the other way this time to the opposition centre half. Okay, defensive midfielders come. Now your centre forwards come really deep here. Okay, so 
other players around him have noticed that. So he's come deep, asking for the ball. Now, the centre half decided to come with him, which has created the space in there for the attacking mid midfield to go in. So we've got a, re a midfield rotation in there. Okay, second example, go out the other side this time. Our sent midfielders come deep to get the ball. He's being followed. Attacking midfielder comes deep. Again, it's about a player taking up a space that's been vacated by another player. Okay, this doesn't happen a lot. A lot of the time, our midfielder will be watch, watching what's happening here. He'll just watch the centre midfielder go. Okay, but when that centre midfielder is moving to this side, he'll either not be followed, in which case he can get possession of the ball, or if he is followed, he's creating a space for us to gain possession higher up the field. So now we've got possession in our middle third. Some rotation between our front two, okay, which will confuse the opp opposition and we can play in there, play in behind. Just a couple of examples here. You can be creative with this, come up with your own, but we need plans. Okay, You cannot just expect players to go out there and just do it off the cuff. If players are doing things off the cuff, it was you're always going to be behind. Okay, counter-attacking. When to apply, obviously immediately after the opposition is given away possession. That is the point at when the opposition is most vulnerable. And I'll take you back to our screen. If we give the ball away in this area of the pitch, look how vulnerable we would be in them first few seconds until we regained our defensive shape. Okay, Then first few seconds when you win it back are paramount importance. So when you have won possession, can you already be looking as you're trying to win the possession? If you do win it, what pass can you play? Are your attacking players available for that first pass? So when the attacking players are in position to play in advanced positions, when the opposition is spread across the pitch to play possession football, which following the Australian national curriculum, most teams are doing, uh, when playing a defensive retreat, and obviously when we're playing a defensive retreat, the opposition are going to be vulnerable very to a quick counter-attack. How to apply? Attackers to position themselves to attack even when they are defending. Okay, so when you see in midfield trying to win possession back, can attackers get themselves in a position and ask them the question, if we win the ball now, what run am I going to make? How can I hurt the opposition? Can I be available for that first pass? Okay, very important. Doesn't happen enough. A lot of ball watching goes on. Defenders to be aware of attackers' positions even when they are defending. Okay, so that's the opposite. So a defender is going in to win the ball. What's he going to do if he wins it? So a defender needs to be thinking about attacking even when he's pressing and trying to win the ball. Okay, that's what clever ball. That's what clever footballers and that's what top footballers do. Quick, decisive passing, running with the ball to exploit space and break lines. Okay. You're probably looking six to nine seconds for the ball to be won and then in the back of the opposition's net. Okay. Attackers able to make good runs, run with the ball at pace, take on opponents and use their vision and flair to create goal scoring opportunities. Okay, so we look at your position requirements. So when you're looking for your 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 you're doing your trials, when you're looking for players, okay, obviously your goalkeepers are a little bit of a different entity, but we do want goalkeepers with the ability to use their feet to play out. Okay? Be vocal, good communicators, good organizers, ability to read the game, dominant in the penalty area, leader from the back, and excellent shot stoppers. That's your perfect goalkeeper. Fullbacks, technically good on the ball. So this is what we want to produce. Fullbacks are technically good on the ball, not just the players that end up at fullbacks because they're not technically good to play anywhere else. Look at the philosophy and the way we play football and look how important the fullbacks are to your attacking. Okay, They must be able to produce good attacking moments, good delivery to give you in the box and be smart, quick, fit, agile players. Obviously good defensively in 1v1 situations, confident in possession, good offensively, will overlap. Okay, If a, if a fullback is playing at juniors and he's never got over the halfway line, then there's something wrong. Okay, Fullbacks should be involved with our attack. Okay, Fullbacks shouldn't be defending when we've got the ball. They should be thinking about their positioning, 
but fullback should be offensive when we've got the ball. So good crosses of the balls and their ability to obviously win area battles from them long balls which will be pinged towards them. Okay, defensive midfielders, good technically on the ball, able to keep the ball in tight areas. We skip um, skip center half, it's half some way. Able to keep the ball in tight areas, contribute to the team's defense and attack, excellent readers of the game, excellent leadership and communication, fizzy strong in one v one test. Very, very similar to your center halves if, if that's not in there. Attacking midfielders, technically excellent on the ball. Okay, these are the ones, these are the money men. These are the ones that are hard to come by. Two footy can work both inside and outside. Creative, proactive, can provide assists, crosses, and score goals. They work hard in both attack and defense. And your playmaker, your deep line or your pivot, whatever you want to call him, the ability to link defense to the forward line. Okay, he's, he's so important that we can get him on the ball. So he's got to be technically good. Quick ball handling skills, okay. Excellent vision and awareness, okay. Can provide assists, crosses, and score goals. Can link defensively with the midfield, and the ability to change games, okay. Center forwards ability to hold up the ball, strong in receiving the ball with a back to goal, okay. Good in combination play in final third. Goal scorer obviously, clinical finisher, and ability to create a goal from nothing. He's your match winner, okay. I'm oh, nearly there, fellas. Now we come to your commitment to the club. What's expected of you as a senior coach? And from senior coach, we're now talking, we're not talking about junior coaches now or just coming out to coach their kids, okay? We're talking about senior coaches who are paramount in the development of this football club and your commitment to the club. To provide a professional coaching environment, i.e. equipment and setup, okay? This is the simplest thing to do is to be prepared. If you are not prepared at a coach, forget about it, okay? I understand that work commitments are what they are, okay? But if you take them upon this commitment to coach, you've taken them upon the commitment to the club and your players to provide the most professional coaching environment you can. Just because you're coaching in South Australia and in a state league club, why should you be any less professional than the guy who's out there coaching Adelaide United? Why? Okay, why are your standards so much lower? Okay, so be as professional as you can, and you'll see the benefits of it in your players. You'll, if we ask our players to be professional, we need to be professional ourselves. To create an environment that allows for development of the playing philosophy, so obviously the tactical approach we do to educate yourself and to be able to get the message that we're trying to get across to the players, to them. That's what being a coach is all about. To communicate effectively with your players, not just as a team, we're going to do our play re play reviews every six weeks, so individual chats. You know that are very much an art of coaching is be able to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with your players, okay, and with all your players, and more importantly, probably the players that you're leaving out. To provide the support, dedication, encouragement to succeed. To attend training sessions, be punctual and committed. Okay, obviously work is going to come in, be involved with some players, coaches. I understand that. Okay, but it should be the exception to the rule. To work hard to improve all areas of your coaching, what are you doing away from what I'm providing you to make yourself a better coach? Are you doing the courses? Are you doing coach education? Are you reading? Are you studying? Okay, because if you're not working outside of your training hours, how can you expect your players to? Your, train, your coaching hours are not enough. So please see if we can work hard to work outside of that as well. Okay, to adhere to the club philosophy in every game and training session. Okay, every coach is going to have their own opinion on how they play football. I get that. I understand that. And there'll be some coaches here which disagree with the way I play or the with my philosophy of playing. Okay, that's fine. When you have your own club, okay, you'll be able to instill your own philosophy on playing football. Okay, no playing philosophy is perfect. I get that. I've developed the most perfect playing philosophy I believe I can, okay, for this club and the players that we develop. Okay, so I expect it to be a did to. Again, if we expect players to do this, we need to be doing this. I don't want to see coaches disappearing after training sessions. You know, we hang around after, we have the conversations, we go to senior social functions, functions okay, no exceptions. 
to represent the club in the correct manner, both on and off the field. Okay, obviously that comes across in the way you coach on the sideline as well. Okay, just remember the way you coach on the sideline really does go, go across to your players. If they've got a coach who's effing and jeffing on the sideline and being unprofessional, don't be surprised when one of your players gets sent off. Okay, you're the leader. Okay, you're the general. They'll generally behave the way you behave. And again, to be a team above all the team. Okay, so I've emailed through to you your coach's pack. Okay, within your coaching pack is going to be the full season training plan, which I've shown you. Ten tactical sessions, okay, um, which are the full training sessions for the tactical ways of how we play. A master session plan. I want to see a session plan at every training session for every coach. So if I come over to you and ask to see your session plan, I want to see it. I've given you the master session plan so you can change it. Um, a good, if you need to do your own diagrams, a great tool to do that is Tactics Manager. Okay, it costs about $80 or something for a lifetime uh, membership, but it's the easiest and most simple tool to create your diagrams for your session plans. But you must have them. Do not turn up to one session without a session plan. Okay, because that is just, that, that's just amateur. That's not semi-professional. Okay, you, if you expect your players to be prepared, you be prepared. Okay, a team sheet that you can use for match day, the FIFA 11 warm up, player review sheet. So I want to see this. I'm going to get these. Um, I want to see these at the end of every review. I want to see them for every single player. Okay, uh, set pieces, the conditioning workout, and obviously we're not doing the uh, presentation live. So if you do have any questions, please email me, or we can sit and arrange a time to go through some of it personally. But thanks for your time. Okay, and I'll see you next Tuesday at the start of pre-season training. Those of you who are tuning in for online on, on via YouTube, I hope this has given you a little bit of understanding of what um, a pre-season presentation should look like if you're a, a senior coach, and hopefully giving you some ideas as well. Uh, any questions, feel free to uh, submit at the bottom of the page. Thanks for listening.